Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... God's grace is yours and his peace is yours. From God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. Please listen again to the words of Luke chapter 12, the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you. And then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you, and then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Dear sons and daughters of our heavenly king and heirs of God's eternal riches, Jesus told us this parable about the landowner to warn us about the extreme dangers of greed. Greed is a, a great big ugly monster. Greed makes people do horrible things to each other. Hatred, murder, slander, and all kinds of other sins, even entire wars, and complete genocide have been committed because of the greed of one person or a group of people. And when we see someone's greed hurting, harming, affecting negatively other people around them, we rightly throw up our arms in disgust, shake our heads. Maybe you hear about a, a professional athlete who abandons his team in their time of need and, and finds another contract that'll pay him five million instead of four and a half million or 25 million instead of 20 million. We shake our heads in dismay. Or maybe that just happens so often we don't, we don't even notice it anymore. Um, but if, let's say, a pharmaceutical company jacks up the price on one of their life-saving drugs by 500% just to make a profit, there is an uproar. This is unjust. This is greed. And we do need to watch out that greedy people out there in the world don't take advantage of us and, and other hard-working people like us. But Jesus did not tell us this parable. He did not have it recorded by the pen of Luke in scriptures to warn us about the dangers of greed and greedy people out there in the world. He taught us this parable and wants us to learn this lesson to warn us about the greed that lives inside each and every one of us and the dangers that it poses for us. All too often, we hear the warnings of our Lord in his word over and over again, and we're willing to sit back and relax comfortably and judge other people out there, especially rich people in the world around us. It doesn't bother us too much to hear words like uh, James chapter 5, where James writes, Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Look, the wages that you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. You have lived in luxury and self-indulgence. You have condemned and murdered innocent people who were not opposing you. And we think, yeah, you watch out, you rich people. 
God's going to come and condemn you for your greed. He's going to stand up for those people that you're hurting, the people that you are committing injustices against by your greed, and, and, and you're robbing and hurting other people. But that kind of thinking is entirely self-righteous, isn't it? It's completely forgetting, completely overlooking, denying even the greed that lives in our hearts by nature. You don't have to be rich to be greedy. You don't have to have a whole lot of money to be greedy. And even on top of that, by the standards of Jesus' day and even by the standards of our world today, each and every one of us here is very, very rich. The Washington Post wrote an article recently that talked about this disparity between what Americans think is rich and what the rest of the world does. The average American thinks, according to this study, that the average individual income around the world, but I want to guess maybe, but put a number in your head. What do you think the average person around the world earns in a year? The average American thinks that number is about $20,000. Way off. The average individual around the world earns just over $2,000. So let's think, if you're an average American who has a salary, let's say fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, you're way up here, and the average worldwide is down there just up off the floor. How many millions of people have to be below that average in order to keep the average down that low? Millions of people earn less than $2,000 every year. This same article from the Washington Post also said that most Americans think that they fit in somewhere in the top one-third, actually 37% of income distribution worldwide. But most Americans, almost all Americans, in reality, fit very comfortably within the top 10% of income earners worldwide. By the standards of Jesus' day, and even by the standards of today, each and every one of us here is very rich. Whether you feel like it or not, when you look at the other rich people around you, you are very rich. God has blessed you abundantly with the wealth that you need to live day to day. The Bible is filled with warnings for rich people like us, like the verses I read to you from our gospel lesson from Luke and the verses I just read from James chapter 5. And Jesus also said, In Luke chapter 18, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter into the kingdom of God. It's so difficult for a rich person, for someone who has been blessed with wealth, to enter into the kingdom of God and be saved that Jesus actually uses the word impossible. Impossible for us but thankfully not impossible for God. It is so difficult because the allure of wealth is all around us. Just think about it. Most Americans, I'm just going to guess most of the people here today, have reached a standard of wealth that you're able to afford not just one television, but multiple television sets in your home, even though you only watch one of them at a time, right? Right? And yet, when you're able to afford a television set and watch that television and pay for the the, uh, programming that's on it, what then happens? All of those, those TV commercials, TV shows, bring new exposure into our lives, into our very living rooms. And and what do you see? You see those commercials that that make you, they're designed to, to... to well up these feelings inside of you to to want something more that you don't have. Even just watching TV shows, oh, that the outfit that she's wearing or the car that he's driving, 
They're designed to make you want those things. And so when you reach a certain level of wealth, then there are more temptations of wealth that pour into our hearts and into our lives. Without a miracle of God, the cards are so stacked against us we could never be saved. And that's why Jesus' warnings, God's warnings, Paul's warnings in the Bible about wealth are not just for the millionaires out there in the world. They are for all of us, for you and me here today. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, Jesus warns us. In our lives, we're on our guards against lots of things on our guard against identity theft. Maybe some of you heard about somebody who was texting using my, my name this past week while I was gone. We're on our guard against high blood pressure. We're on our guard against all kinds of different things. But what steps, what actions do you take to be on your guard against the greed that is seeking to take a foothold in your life. I'll be honest, I don't think I've sat down and said, you know what, I really need to take some steps here. I need to take some action to make sure and defend myself, my heart, and my life from these influences of greed that are all around me trying to inspire greed within my heart. What can we do? How can we be in our guard? How can we fight against greed? One last warning I have for you today. Typically, when we think about the sin of greed, we think of maybe a ninth or tenth commandment issue. Coveting, sinfully wanting things that belong to other people, things that God has not given to us. But the Apostle Paul told us in our second lesson today that greed is not just a ninth and tenth commandment issue. Greed is a first commandment issue. Did you hear what he said? Greed, which is idolatry. Greed is not a sin because it hurts someone else around us. Greed is a sin in our hearts even if we never act on it. Greed is having feelings toward our things, toward our possessions that we should only have toward God. Looking at those things as the source of our good the source of our happiness, our security, our joy, and our blessing. We are to look at God and him alone, love him above all things, and turn to him for our help in every time of need. Those are feelings that we ought to feel only for God alone, and greed means taking those feelings away from him and placing them on the blessings that God has given us. And yet it is so ingrained in us to believe that money and having the things that we want in this life will make us happier, will make our lives better, so much so that we look at this parable. Maybe you looked at this parable from Jesus in Luke chapter 12 and you go, what did this guy do wrong? I mean, honestly, think about this scenario that's happening. This man that Jesus introduces us to in this parable sounds like a wise, strategic, hardworking farmer. One year he's got a bumper crop, far more than his old barns could handle. Have you ever had that problem? Maybe not. Maybe you're, maybe you're not a farmer. Um, but let's say you've got more money that you can save than you're allowed to put in your Roth IRA this year. And so what do you do? Doesn't it sound like a wise choice to find somewhere else to store the blessings that you have been given? Doesn't this landowner's decision to build new barns that would store his grain make good sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good decision. The problem that Jesus is pointing to is not with this man's actions. There is nothing wrong with building bigger barns to store your surplus grain. There is nothing wrong with finding another investment to save for retirement over and above your IRA. The problem was in his heart. He trusted in his wealth 
to bring him security and happiness and value in his life. He looked to the good things that God had given him and trusted in them to take care of him rather than God. He loved God's blessings but did not love God. The temptations of greed, the temptations of wealth, the allure of prosperity is all around us. Even as I sit in my office preparing for our service over the weekend, I, my, my window faces out towards Main Street, and oh, oh, there goes a beautiful shiny yellow sports car driving by, and whew, there's a, a car pulling a, a brand, brand new boat, and oh, there's a jet ski, and look at that, that 50-foot RV pulling a, a brand new Jeep 4x4. Man, I mean, there are things rolling down Main Street here in Stoddard that'll make your heart uh, heart stutter a little bit. And I need to remember, it's, all of us need to remember, it's not a sin to be rich. It's not a sin to enjoy the blessings that God has given you. It's not a sin to own a boat or an RV, even a very expensive one, to own a beautiful, expensive house. There's nothing wrong with building bigger barns or finding other places to store your surplus wealth and income. What's sinful is to put your hope and trust in those things to make you happy and to give your life meaning because they won't. They can't. They weren't designed by God to do that for you. The only thing that can bring us true and lasting joy and meaning and value to our lives is our Lord and our relationship with him. St. Augustine wrote a long time ago, O Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And Christians have taken this illustration and, and painted it as a picture as if God has left each and every one of us with a, a giant hole in our lives, a hole that's like, like a puzzle piece shaped like God. He has placed in us the desire to be filled, for our lives to be made whole and complete, and he has made himself the only one who can fill that role completely. And yet we sinners run around trying to fill our lives with anything other than God, with pleasures and, and accomplishments and education and, and wealth and, and toys and activities when the only thing that will make us whole and complete is God. So how wonderful it is then to open his word and hear again and again him telling us that he gives himself to us completely in Jesus our Savior. Jesus stepped down from heaven, giving up the riches and glory of his eternal heavenly home and became a human being to suffer and die to take away all of our sins. He loved us more than anything even giving his own life so that you and I would know the love of our Heavenly Father that fills that God-shaped hole in our hearts. And he showed us in his earthly life for those 33 years and continues to show us even to this day that all of our blessings, all of our good things in life come directly from our Heavenly Father. He is where our blessings come from and he gave our lives true value by paying the most costly price ever paid in the history of the universe. So what do we do? How do we guard our hearts? How do we guard that hole in our hearts so that it can only be filled by God? What can we do to stay on our guard against greed like Jesus commands? Well, there may be times when You need to just turn off the TV and don't let those commercials, when you feel that desire welling up in your hearts, turn it off. Picture mute or whatever it might be, turn it off completely. Maybe I need to turn my desk so it doesn't face Main Street. Take steps when you feel that greed welling up in your heart, take steps to guard yourself from that. Walking through the shops, does that make you fill your heart with greed? Maybe find something else to do with your family, to do in your free time. Guard yourselves against that greed. Close the magazine. 
open instead God's word and fill your heart with him until there's no room left for greed to grab and, take and put in a foothold. Turn to Jesus every day for forgiveness for your greed and admit that without him you would surely fall into the temptations of wealth. Pray for his protection and his strength to fight against greed. Make him the focus and the joy, the delight of your life instead of wealth and pleasures. And he promises that he's going to give you all of those things anyway as he sees fit according to his wisdom and not necessarily how you and when you want. There's something else you can do with the blessings that God has given you to guard your hearts. It's important for us to give thanks. It's not just a duty that we owe to our Heavenly Father for the many, many blessings that he has given us. It's good for us to give thanks, to recognize where these blessings come from, and to turn to him and give him praise. It helps us remember, (coughs) excuse me, it helps us to remember that these are not blessings that have been given to us permanently. They're, They're gifts from God for us to use for a time. And at any moment, he can call for them back. And another way you can guard yourself and your heart against the temptations of greed is to take that wealth and show it who's boss by giving it away. Sacrifice the blessings that God has given you by using them for others to the glory of your Heavenly Father. You will find such joy comes from using those possessions, those time, those talents to honor your heavenly Father and to help others rather than to serve yourself and just to bring pleasure into your own lives. Take care of your family with them. Find some needy cause, some person in need, and help them out. Give it away, and you will find great joy in that wealth. See, God has not given you wealth in order to make you feel secure in your life. Your security comes from him. God has not given you your wealth in this life in order to bring joy and happiness into your life. Our joy and our happiness comes from our right relationship with him through Jesus. God has not given you wealth in this life in order to give your life a value, a number. The value for your life comes from the price that Jesus was willing to pay for you on the cross. In the eyes of the world, Each and every one of you here is very rich. But in the eyes of your God, and from the view of eternity, as we stand in heaven and look back at the earthly lives that God has given us, we'll recognize we are even richer still because God has blessed us with his eternal heavenly kingdom and all of his eternal riches. Amen. Please stand. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at the following times, like us on Facebook, or visit our website for audio and video sermons or to find out more about our congregation. God bless your week in the Lord.